As a society, we're obsessed with being the best. Whether it's sports, art, action figures, the goal is to stand atop Championship Mountain and look down at all the losers who failed to do what you did. But this list isn't about being the best. This list is about disappointment, the inability to meet expectations, and the blatant failure to connect with fans, which I would also advise our first ever live studio audience to keep in mind as we proceed. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the Top 10 Worst Action Figure Vehicles. Yeah, clap, laugh. That's not the only <clears throat> I hope that's not the last laugh we get. <clears throat> the only way to really know what the top 10 worst action figure vehicles of all time are was to ask you, the collectors who have the knowledge and experience, you are the people who have lived through the disappointing gift openings and diluted play value of dollars spent. We asked you to give us your picks on social media outlets, Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon. This is the result of hundreds of voters casting thousands of votes. Fair or not, the results are the results. The cold, efficient machine of pure, unfiltered democracy makes no mistakes. The list is the list. Number 10 is 1986 Matchbox Robotech Veritech Fighter, intended for use with the corresponding 4-inch Matchbox action figures. In and of itself, it is not a bad thing. Certainly not one of the worst things ever created by the hands of humans. Fans love the design of the fighter by default. It has an opening cockpit, variable sweep wings, removable booster and missile pods, the classic VF-1S Skull Squadron deco. It's basically just a smaller, cooler looking Sky Striker. But that's the problem. For all the coolness of the way it looks, the expected functionality is absent. This cool looking jet had one job and that was to turn into a jet with legs on its way to a full robot style robot. It is that betrayal of expectations that overrides the actual inherent goodness of the thing. It is the degree to which it cloaked itself in fulfillment only to reveal itself in the end as a sheep in wolf's clothing. Number nine is 1994 Todd Toys Spawn Mobile. Two terms you don't hear a lot of anymore, Todd Toys and Spawn Mobile, both of which may need a bit of explanation. <laughs> Todd Toys was the name Spawn creator Todd McFarlane originally gave to his toy company back in 1994 when this vehicle was released. He changed the name after being pressured by Mattel out of concern that people might associate his hell-inspired super anti-hero toys with Barbie's younger brother. <laughs> The Spawnmobile, a portmanteau of the words spawn and automobile, is one would assume a car to be driven by its namesake, that is, Spawn. The name is a subtle nod to the most famous car in the history of pop culture, the Batmobile, a portmanteau itself of the words bat and mobile. <laughs> I don't deserve it for that. I don't deserve it for that. <laughs> Save that for later when it's funny. <clears throat> But this car didn't exist to move a demon hell spawn around town. What car could? It was a cross-media marketing effort where an actual real-life race car was painted up and emblazoned with the same paint deco, and fans were encouraged to vote on which treatment, the white side or the black side, was going to be the final design. A toy version was created with both the black and the white sides, and the issue was never resolved. And it was all in the interest of increasing the visibility of the brand, which it did, while delivering a vehicle that has no narrative or contextual relevance to the character and the mythology beyond its inclusion in the line for purely toyetic reasons. Number eight is 1984 Mattel Masters of the Universe Dragon Walker. How this got the vote and not the Blaster Hawk or the Bashasaurus or any of the vehicles from the new adventures of He-Man, I do not know. And that's not true because I do know. More people own the Dragon Walker than owned any of those other potential disappointments. So more people remember what feelings the Dragon Walker inspired within them. The tough part about Masters of the Universe vehicles is that despite their frequently ridiculous designs, the box art did all the heavy lifting, putting those unbelievable things into a context that wasn't just otherworldly, it was alluring. The Dragon Walker was just one of those vehicles that compelled you to experience it within the imagined landscape of volcanoes and tiny dinosaurs. But why on any earth would He-Man need a vehicle that traveled slower than he could walk, that exposed him to any and all attacks from every evil henchman and or ill-intentioned passers-by? That's an awful lot of risk in the name of style. Number seven is 1987 Hasbro G.I. Joe Coastal Defender. 
This particular vehicle grabbed the number five on our top 10 worst G.I. Joe vehicles list back in 2016. I'm not sure what the conversion rate is for the value of a worst G.I. Joe ranking with respect to the top overall worst list. With the evidence at hand, it has, at the very least, a minus two modifier. The controversy here is whether or not the Coastal Defender is actually a vehicle since it lacks a propulsion system. The intent is that inside this box full of missiles, this battle chair is towed into a potential combat zone. It maintains a tactical location where it and the operator can wait, disguised as a wooden box, until Cobra is within range. There'll be a picture up on screen if you don't know what it looks like. <laughs> then whatever green shirt pulled the short string gets to pop out, completely exposed, and fire off one of four different missiles four times, or one shot of four missiles, and then GTFO. <laughs> Its only gimmick is the element of surprise, and that surprise is mostly experienced by the sad sack that has to take their life into their own hands instead of operating it from the safety of the G.I. Joe headquarters a million miles away. Number six is 1994 Toy Biz X-Men Magneto Magnetron. First of all, and this has been coming for a long time, I am told that the character's name is Magneto, pronounced Magneto. You may call me Magneto. Sorry to disappoint you, Magneto. Magneto is one screwed up dude. No, Magneto, I let you in before. True, but we know Magneto's his kidnapper. The mutant known as Magneto is... Magneto! Lord Magneto! My name is Magneto. Even though he derives all of his powers from magnets, pronounced... <laughs> magnets. All right, you don't want to help me out on that one? <laughs> <laughs> How is this vehicle supposed to be pronounced? Magnetron? Magnetron? Is this Magneto's Magnetron? I refuse to believe that in this particular case, the word has two different pronunciations. So pick one or the other because we're not switching back and forth in some guessing game for the rest of eternity. <laughs> Narratively, it's not a stretch to think that Magneto could assemble a car from whatever metal parts were lying around, which is what this thing looks like. It's like a few different vehicles smished together through an angry force of will. The question is, where is Magneto going that he needs ground transportation to get there? Ground transportation to get there. <laughs> No, we're gonna let it go? It's all going in. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> he can fly. He certainly doesn't need a vehicle to catapult metallic discs. And if that isn't enough, the Magnetron also has magnets on the nose and fenders that can transport metallic steak jo space junk. <laughs> and double side sweepers that sweep the ground collecting metal debris. Metal debris not included. Magneto, ever the misunderstood character, is out to clean up the planet from the inferior Homo sapiens and catapult all their junk on top of the mutant superhero X-Men. Number five is 1991 Toy Biz X-Men Wolverine Mutant Cycle. Look, if Wolverine is going to have a bike, yeah, it makes sense to have claws on it and colors themed after his costume. If they had stopped there, I don't think anyone is complaining about this piece. It's a motorcycle, so pop wheelie action is given and the call out is right on the box, but it's the pedal powered transformable face that really pushes this thing into worst territory. Toy Biz decided that the motorcycle itself needed to mutate in some way. So the front of the motorcycle mutates from a sort of robot lion mouth into Wolverine's face. And not just Wolverine's face, but Logan's unmasked face <laughs> while he rides that same motorcycle wearing a mask to conceal the identity <laughs> of his face. <laughs> Further evidence that Wolverine has always been an in-your-face kind of character and, in this example, in-your-face with his face at 80 miles per hour. <laughs> Number four is 1981 through 1984 Kenner Star Wars mini rigs. This is a tough one. In and of themselves, I know why they exist. They were pitched as a line of vehicles that were more affordable at a time when the price of plastic was going up and it was getting way too expensive to do anything large scale. Yes, I know. <laughs> Yes, I know. <laughs> yes, I know. Kenner realized, re released the ADAT and the Imperial Shuttle, re released the Millennium Falcon, but mini rigs were also about trying to capture more of the toy market while recognizing that not every kid could afford those larger pieces. Mini rigs were a compromise. They looked and felt like they could have been in the Star Wars universe, and in many cases have since been featured in expanded universe media. The price point was lower, and for the most part, they possessed the critical minimum requirements for cool vehicles, both a cockpit and guns. But there's no denying that the ultimate recipient knew that this was a half measure, no matter how well-intentioned it may have been. No offense to master toy designer and Hall of Famer Mark Boudreau, but the mini rigs rank for being what they were seen as, the absolute minimum effort to satisfy the absolute minimum requirements to deliver a Star Wars vehicle. It's the embodiment of the D-minus. You passed, 
but barely. Number three is 1987 Hasbro Cobra Pogo Ballistic Battle Ball. Also covered in the worst G.I. Joe vehicles list back in 2016, this drug-induced hallucination was in the number four spot. Now, three years later, it's in the third worst overall. It's getting worse with age. This design isn't just about troops getting into the battlefield, it's about overwhelming the senses and outwitting the tactical knowledge possessed by the Joes. Because they're prepared for jets and tanks and boats, but they didn't prepare for a frog-legged bouncing battle ball, and it's in that split second of stunned indecision about how to counter the attack that Cobra fires a dozen lasers harmlessly past your head. <laughs> Cobra designers pushed the limits of applied military technologies, but kids wanted plausible tanks and helicopters and maybe a kit-bashed junkyard car. But not this. There's nothing cool about a three-legged glass-topped rocket-powered death barrel that hops in and out of combat situations. I don't care how many missiles you put on it. <laughs> that was natural, right? <laughs> the whole thing is an exercise All right. in natural. All right. So long as you guys are seeing the same thing I am. <laughs> Number two is 1978 Empire Toys Spider Copter. The Spider Copter is a helicopter designed for use with 8-inch action figures, namely the Mego style figures from World's Greatest Superheroes, Star Trek, Planet of the Apes, or any of the other licenses Mego was producing figures for in the 1970s. That said, this was produced by Empire Toys for use with Mego figures, not by Mego themselves. It's a third-party product introduced to take advantage of an existing successful line of toys without actually violating any licensing agreements. The spider copter isn't the first time this mold was used, and not the last. Hulk, Batman, Chips. It was used for a lot of different characters. Spider-Man, of all those choices, is the least likely to need a helicopter, and that is why this vehicle takes the two spot. For all the characters, for all the superheroes who are more than capable of getting around, for whom the use of a vehicle would actually be a detriment to their success, the spider copter is here for you. This is for all the vehicles that have nothing to do with the hero, but come across more like a super fan of the character and their bedazzled ride that they show off at comic book conventions across the country. Spider-Man doesn't need a helicopter unless he's planning on making a transatlantic trip via web-slinging. Hulk doesn't need a van unless he's going to just crash in it after he switches back to Bruce Banner and doesn't want to wake up in the middle of the street half naked. <laughs> As a helicopter, it's fine. As an affront to the dignity of superhero action figures, it is tasteless, offensive, unnecessary. It's the second worst vehicle ever. Every time we do these lists, there's always three sections. 10 through seven are somewhat interchangeable. Two through six are pretty solidly locked in. And there's always one that takes a lead and keeps on going until there's no way the other nine could possibly close the distance. And that happened again here. Number one is 1986 Kenner Justice Jogger Overland Villain Chaser. If we all put our heads together, we might be able to come up with a situation where this is actually narratively useful. And to be fair to the box art, the idea of Superman using vehicles isn't that far-fetched. There are frequently times where he has used vehicles in the past, environments that are contaminated with kryptonite, extended absences from a yellow sun that drains his powers, red suns, vampires, magic, and whatever else a writer can contrive. That said, the idea that an open vehicle with walking legs that is self-advertised as being limited to jogging speed hardly seems helpful in any way. This is essentially what Palpatine's hologram is writing in The Phantom Menace. <laughs> The Justice Jogger doesn't even have footrests. In the box art, Superman's legs are just hanging there, swinging back and forth as this thing jogs him around. He is completely exposed in this thing, a reoccurring theme with many of the worst vehicles. Well, everything is exposed except his face, which is conveniently behind a protective shield. And you know, that said, it's got some translucent plastic parts, so it's not all bad. It's kind of like a Zoids creature crossed over into the DC universe. It has wind-up walking action via the radar dish. But seriously, the call-out on the box is power-stepping action, which applies to anything with legs and or feet. Superman himself has power-stepping action. <laughs> I have power-stepping action. <laughs> But taking a closer look at the illustration of Superman piloting the Justice Jogger, that dude is not happy to be in that chair. And looking even closer, his hands aren't even on the control panel. He's not driving, he's a passenger. No kid, no fan, no one would be so wooed by this item as to want it or be happy to have it. It is the ultimate insult to Superman and all the other superpowered characters. It is, I mean, it's not really that bad a toy per se, out of context, but it is the number one worst action figure vehicle. Hey! <laughs> so natural, unprompted. <clears throat>
The most popular lines got the most votes because those are the ones that most people owned. Yeah, there's a lot of bargain bin garbage out there that would have certainly qualified, but it's these main lines that people know, had the highest expectations for, and were most let down by. Thank you for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. Uh, if you're in the channel position to help the channel grow, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toy galaxy. Please share this video. And I would like to offer a very special, super special thank you to Double Midnight Comics for hosting and to everyone here who was able to come out to the meetup today to be part of our first ever live audience. Give yourselves a hand.